Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming so early in the morning, uh, leaving the comfort of your bed and any other number of possibilities that you have for this fantastic day uh, to be with us. Let me first and foremost immediately add my voice to Professor uh, Thabani's acknowledgement of the indigenous uh, people here on whose land we stand and live as one of the most recent immigrants on this blessed continent. I uh, consider myself uh, blessed to be on the land of the indigenous people and I'm honored and I'm grateful to them to be a host to me and my family. Uh, let me also uh, thank my host, uh, Professor Mushtaba Mahdavi, and the Green College uh, and the staff, my former student, Ruzbe Safshikan, and everybody else. As we age, my generation, we become finickier and finickier in traveling and uh, moving me from the Atlantic coast to the, uh, to the Pacific uh, these days is quite, uh, quite a task, and I'm very grateful for the generosity and kindness of uh, my colleagues here uh, to accommodate that. Uh, the issue that I wish to share with you today, as Professor Thabani said, uh, concerns the uh, uh, incomplete archives. And as I talk, I have a kind of a not synchronized show and tell that is, as I speak, you will also be distracted by a series of uh, posters that you will see. But eventually, by the, I promise by the end of my talk, my uh, narrative and these pictures will coalesce. So bear with the uh, incongruity for a while. Uh, let me begin my story with the Iranian Revolution of 1979. When the uh, Iranian Revolution of 1977-79 happened, I was a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and like everybody else, I was entirely fascinated by what was unfolding uh, in front of me. And uh, as I was getting ready to go to Iran to be closer, I was a graduate student I, on a student visa uh, uh, in Philadelphia, uh, the, uh, the hostages were taken. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, summer of 1979, I went to Iran, and in November, the hostages were taken. And as a result, much of my research on the revolution remained uh, unfinished. So I had to change the subject of my dissertation, as it happens. And instead of writing on the Iranian revolution, uh, because I was fascinated by this phenomenon of Ayatollah Khomeini's captivation of an entire nation's imagination, I was drawn to a charismatic, the nature of charismatic authority, and I wrote my doctoral dissertation and subsequently first book on the nature of charismatic authority, but I projected the figure of Ayatollah Khomeini to the charismatic authority in Islamic tradition, namely the Prophet Muhammad. So my dissertation was on the formation of Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad's charismatic authority and subsequent what Weber calls routinization of that uh, uh, a charismatic authority in various uh, directions. Uh, but soon after my graduation, I began to uh, write a detailed book on the ideological formation of the revolution. Uh, and uh, here I sat, I, and now I look at the, my book, Theology of Discontent, and I have, cannot fathom how I mustered so much patience to read so much gibberish. Uh, <laughs> Because, but in the back of my mind was a conviction that after this generation, nobody will really have the patience to sit through what Ayatollah Khomeini said from the day that he was born until that day, and Mutahari, and Shariati, and Al Ahmad, and uh, this and that. Some of it was uh, exciting to read, but some of it was a sheer task. To, to read it. And in fact, as I was reading it, uh, I was working, I was reminded of passages in Ferdowsi's Shahnameh. I'm not comparing myself with Ferdowsi, I'm just using him as a, as a uh, model, in which he, uh, he uh, when he tells the stories, he's, he loves it and he thrives at these stories, and then when he has to report, and he does, about certain historical incidents, he says, well, I'm so happy this is over. It was so boring, but I had to do it. Uh, so I finished that book and published it in 1993, and I looked at it, 
and it seemed to me it lacked uh, in, uh, in some fundamental way. It was mostly a coverage of ideological dimensions of the revolution. And uh, since I'm, I'm by training and education a sociologist, I ask myself, so what about public? What about people out in the streets? What about uh, university campuses, factories, uh, uh, squares? Et what about them? How did they, how were they mobilized? Here I began to uh, collect uh, whatever visual evidence that I could uh, collect, graffitis, murals, uh, even uh, uh, chewing gum wraps, uh, and which you had said a death to America. You want to have a chew chewing gum and you open it up and say, oh, death to America, oh, lovely. Uh, and uh, billboards, whatever visual. I mean, the, the, my intention was to do something on the iconography of the, of the revolution. And as I was collecting, I realized that one of my dearest friends and colleagues, uh, Peter Tchaikovsky, had already a massive collection of these uh, documents. So eventually, Peter Tchaikovsky and I, we wrote a book called The Staging a Revolution, in which we uh, produced and analyzed and uh, uh, discussed any number of visual evidence of the revolution that we could collect. And the book was published. We had a problem with our publisher because as he signed with us, he suddenly struck a very lucrative deal with Islamic Republic for a three-volume book on uh, majesty of Islamic Republic. And as a result, he sat on our book for a couple of years. But so eventually, the book was published, a Staging a Revolution. And soon, it went out of print. And now, uh, soon after that, it became a collector's item for the following reason. As we were collecting the data, we couldn't care less if this visual evidence came from ideologically from an Islamist uh, tradition, or a socialist tradition, or an anti-colonial nationalist tradition. We couldn't care. We were just collecting whatever came our way and uh, archiving them and, and analyzing them and, and so forth. But soon after the success uh, slash failure of the revolution and the Islamist uh, takeover of it, uh, the ruling regime began to radically Islamize the history of the Iranian struggle and dispense with all other uh, components of the uh, ideological, political, ad, uh, uh, organizational uh, dimensions of the, of the revolution. Now, the collection that we, on which we were working, Peter Tchaikovsky subsequently uh, uh, gave it to an archive in, at Berkeley, uh, Stanford, and then some other collections were also uh, evident. But uh, the, the eventual, over the 30 years, to see how Islamic Republic was systematically uh, and categorically Islamizing uh, a multifaceted cosmopolitan political culture in which is militant Islamism had a role, but it was not the exclusive uh, element, uh, state uh, its course. BBC Persian subsequently did a piece of uh, navigating the, the, the full dimensions of, uh, of this iconic uh, evidence, uh, which was, I was very happy that at least somebody has noticed it and is now more than our book, there was another uh, evidence. Uh, this was the case, cut. Now, let me start a different narrative and I'll bring it all together. The, uh, Green, the so-called Green Movement in Iran began, and like everybody else, I was fascinated by it 30 years after the, uh, the Iranian Revolution. And my take on the, uh, when the Green Movement happened was that something is happening that is not entirely revolutionary, is not entirely reformist. Some of my colleagues began to talk about uh, uh, revolution, re reform and revolution. This is a revolution. Uh, and uh, already my colleague Asif Bayad had proposed the idea of post-Islamism as an idea. Uh, and I uh, began to think about the idea of a civil rights movement, that these people are after the civil liberties. And whether or not uh, the, the, uh, the regime, the, the ruling regime will collapse or will not collapse is secondary to the securing of civil liberties. And then I wrote my book and, and published it. And the, the essential thing that remained with me after the writing of that book on the Green Movement 
was the sense of an epistemic shift that is happening uh, that is predicated on certain demographic facts on, uh, on, the, on the ground, a certain exhaustion of ideological conviction that this uh, generation that we were seeing in, in the streets, they were not necessarily asking for a socialist revolution. They were not necessarily asking for, a man, for an anti-colonial nationalism. There was no flag or there was no uh, it, it, it concrete. Not that ideology was absent totally, but the way that my generation 30 years ago, immediately as soon as you opened your mouth, you, you knew where you stood, this was not uh, the case. What exactly was the nature of this epistemic uh, shift? It was hard to tell. Uh, so I played with the idea of uh, uh, civil uh, uh, unrest, c civil uh, rights movement, and very much began to approximate it to American civil rights movement. The book came out, and uh, I remember I had I was on Empire program with Marwan Bishara uh, in July of uh, that year, but about the month after the uh, Green Movement had started. And in the course of a conversation with Marwan Bishara, just uh, off the cuff, I said, if I were any person in position of authority, anywhere from Morocco to Syria, this is July 2009, I would watch what is happening in Iran very carefully. Because the demographic composition of Iran is exactly the demographic composition of the Arab world. And Iranian kids are not the only one on the internet. Something is, uh, is going on. And another piece I wrote soon after that for CNN, I also said something similar to that. And uh, this was not a premonition, and uh, fortunately the age of prophecy is, uh, is over. We're all on our own. Uh, 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 but it was, as I said, it's simply a, 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 a projected calculation of demographic identity. Soon after that, the events in Tunisia, in Egypt, in uh, uh, Morocco, in, uh, in Yemen, etc., started and, and things went on. I began over the course of a summer re very closely looking at the unfolding of the Arab Revolution and uh, of Arab Springs and began to extend the argument that I had made in the book on the Green Movement, namely assuredly proposing that we have entered the age of uh, an epistemic exhaustion. And that epistemic exhaustion, the way that I articulated, was very similar to Asif Bayat's notion of the of post-Islamism, uh, but a, a bit larger uh, frame of reference. That what has ended, yes, is militant Islamism, but so is third world socialism. So is anti-colonial nationalism. Namely, in my categorization of three forms of ideological formation in the course of encounter with co European uh, co colonial modernity, three forms of ideologies, uh, uh, militant ideologies has, had emerged with which we, various peoples, uh, identified. And for example, in the course of the Iranian revolution, all of these forces, socialist forces, nationalist forces, Islamist forces, existed. And then the Islamist forces uh, sort of categorically claimed it all to itself. And through a succession of university purges, I just met a colleague uh, who was a victim of these university purges uh, in, uh, in, in the north. Uh, cultural revolutions, uh, mass arrest, and uh, execution in, uh, of uh, political prisoners, particularly in the 1980s, they began to destroy all other possible, or try to destroy all, all other possibilities and claim it uh, to themselves. But if historically you go back, all of these Evidence is are there for you to see you, uh, for you to see. Now, here I began to look at my own book on the uh, ideological formation of Islamic revolution, and I realized that the reason I had sat down to read all of these books and to write about the uh, Islamist component of the revolution was that that whole trajectory, that whole panorama, was alien to me. I didn't know what Mutahari had said. I didn't know, what, I mean, I had gone to Hussein Yerushad and listened to uh, Ali Shariati, but Ali Shariati, I looked at Ali Shariati and people who were following Ali Shariati as an urban uh, 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 creature, 
the, 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 the son of a very devout Shi'i mother, and a, as I was telling my f friends uh, last night, a father who was a, a Mossadir nationalist three weeks of the month and a, a, a Nasserite socialist the fourth week because he ran out of money to have his vodka, vodka and, and, uh, and uh, cigarettes. That that very book was being appropriated as evidence of, oh, look, this was an Islamic revolution. So subsequently, 2006, I believe, when, I wrote, when the book came out in a new edition, I wrote a long introduction to it in which I began to explain why uh, this was happening. That in fact, in the political culture of the region, yes, there was a Muhammad Abdul Wahhab who was very important, but not Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, the founder of uh, Wahhabism, but a great Egyptian singer, Muhammad Abdul Wahhab. That he, in fact, in the context of, uh, of, of that generation, that I was the living evidence of a generation of thinkers for whom uh, uh, Zayd Ahmad, uh, 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 poets like Mahmoud Darwish, or uh, uh, Nazim Hikmat, or Ahmad Shamlu, or Pablo Neruda, or uh, Mayakovsky were far more important. And then we couldn't, because we read them all in blessed Persian, and whatever we lost in translation, we gained by the generation of a sense of solidarity that I read Mahmoud Darwish, and I didn't know, oh, oh he's Palestinian. Wow, Mayakovsky is Russian. But there was a generation that, they, uh, that came together from Faiz Ahmad Faiz to Nazim Hikmat, to uh, Pablo Neruda, etc., that coagulated around the formation of, uh, of a cosmopolitan uh, political culture. My conclusion in 2011-2012, uh, when the Arab uh, Spring uh, began, was that no longer those ideological formations are, are operative, and by the proposition of post, the end of post-colonialism, my argument was that uh, that mode of epistemic ideology production was no, no longer valid. It had exhausted its possibilities. And another term that I, uh, that I proposed was deferred defiance, that the experience of postcoloniality, I mean, when, when you look at the figure of Muhammad Gaddafi running for his life in the deserts of Yemen, he was supposed to deliver in terms of emancipation from imperialism, colonialism, etc which he did not deliver. And the same with the Islamic Republic and uh, uh, so forth. So uh, by the, uh, by the uh, conclusion of uh, 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 my writing of the book on the Arab Spring, my assessment was that uh, there is, uh, the, the reason for this uh, epistemic exhaustion or the condition of this epistemic exhaustion has, has gener generated a, a vacuum. And in this vacuum, we are now looking for new ways of understanding what exactly are these uh, revolutions. And uh, here I began to read the leading slogans of the Arab revolutions. Ash-Sha'ab yurid Nizam. People demand overthrow of the regime. I began to read this regime, not just Hosni Mubarak or uh, Gaddafi, but that regime for us on university campuses within the disciplines is the regime of knowledge, regime de savoir. How do we understand what we understand? How do we get to know what we get to know? In other words, the formation, disciplinary formations in political science, in social sciences and humanities, more in social sciences than in humanities. The, for, the disciplinary formations was predicated on a condition within the universities and think tanks and so forth that was no longer corresponding to the emerging realities that we were facing. So the task upon us as thinkers, as, as uh, writers, as uh, scholars, was to begin to uh, not to throw the proverbial baby and the bathwater together, or all universities are all corrupt and so forth. No, begin to see in what particular way there are in epistemic and, and theoretical interpolation that you can begin to, uh, to introduce. And here, for example, the kinds of, uh, say, uh, bourgeois feminism that was rampant 
before the writings of scholars like Mahanti uh, uh, begins to become important, that right now you begin you need to a, a different kinds of consideration of, uh, for example, uh, women's rights movement. And here, when you saw in the uh, squares of uh, uh, Tahrir Square, women in appearances, and if they appeared that way in the streets of Paris, Sarkozy would have them ar arrested, but here they were re leading a revolution, you began to realize that what the whole notion of veiling and unveiling and so forth, in the course of which, mandatory veiling in Iran and mandatory unveiling in Europe, that is, you couldn't have a job if you wanted to uh, think, uh, Sheila Ben Habib has written on this, that was the amounted to the transmutation of the sight of the female body into an ideological battleground between Ahmadinejad, sort of symbolically, and Sarkozy. And I sort of said, how about if we give a pair of gloves to Sarkozy and Ahmadinejad, they can go to a ring and sort out their differences, leave women to their own bodies and to their own devices, and so forth. So my, I began to think about the question of veiling or unveiling the, the, first of all, fetishization, I'm a, I'm a son of a veiling mother. That the whole fetishization of veiling, that this is something fixated, social segregation, etc., became very strange to me because this is not the way veiling, so-called, acted as I grew up with a veiling mother. You have your chador on and you go to a market, uh, oranges are on uh, sale, suddenly this veil becomes a, a sack in which you put the oranges. Your child falls asleep on your lap, this becomes a cover for your, against the flies for, for your child. So it has multiple functions. So it is not just to hold your face. And also I began to think about what is this mo particular mode of holding your face? It, the process of urbanization, when a couple from a proverbial rural area entered urban city, urban uh, areas, jobs that are available are only <coughs> limited to the male members of the thing. So, so mothers go home, it's not that this word khanedar, housewife, uh, is uh, that they are not doing anything. No, this, that's also abused labor. So you have two, one paycheck for two labor. That's what it is. Uh, so the whole notion of uh, Habermasian public space, private space begins to sort of uh, reconfigure itself. And historically, not only in the Arab and Muslim world, Iran and others, but in Europe, in the United States, women's rights movement begins commencement with women's entering labor market force, entering job market. 63% of the university entrants in Iran right now are women. Only 12.3% are part of the labor force. And that is, has nothing to do with reformists or Ahmadinejad or anything. Iranian uh, economy is oil-based economy. Oil-based eco economy doesn't generate job. So 50% of the university graduates enter, go leave universities without job prospect and have to go to their uh, parents' home waiting to get married to go out. I mean, recently this is beginning to change. Single Iranian women are now can actually go and rent an apartment, but of course they have a way, fake wedding band uh, in order to pretend that they are married and uh, to, to, get a, to get an apartment. But uh, when the Green Movement happened and people say, oh, these are bourgeois northern Tehranis simply because of their uh, hairdo, uh, the fact is that in 1997, Three million high school graduated participated in the in, uh, national uh, uh, university entrance examination. The entire capacity of public universities in Iran was 240,000, meaning less than 10%, meaning more than 90% uh, don't have a university to go to that is legitimate and generates jobs. And uh, as a result, uh, they are some of them are absorbed into three layers of militarized security apparatus. The Pasdaran, the uh, Basijis, and the Hezbollahis. Three la layers of militarized security apparatus begins to employ some of these youth, incorporate them into the ideological apparatus of the Islamic Republic. And in fact, they are the ones that they have a motorcycle, have a, a monthly check, they can rent an apartment, they can marry, and they can form a family. So if there's anybody close to a notion of middle class, are not these kids in northern Tehran with their hairdo and uh, sunglasses and uh, still living with their parents, but it's actually those who have a monthly check. These are all 
uh, as we uh, oscillate between the uh, Arab scene and Iranian scene, the two begin to uh, coagulate in the sense that a standard received ideological, political formulations no longer really corresponds to this reality. It is at this point that something absolutely extraordinary happened, which is I received an email from someone who said, uh, I have a collection of uh, revolutionary posters. I wonder if they are of any use to you. I understand you published a book on revolutionary posters. My name is and so and so, and I have a gallery in Asheville, North Carolina. <laughs> Asheville, North Carolina. So I said, well, can I see some of these posters? And he said, yes, happily. And he sent to me a few of these posters, and I looked at them. You're now looking at some of those posters. And I was, uh, I had two reactions. My first reaction was, oh, I've seen these posters. I, they're out of my system. I really don't want to have anything to say about these posters. But the more I looked, something else began to emerge. First and foremost, I began to realize that here there were accumulated 146 posters in mint condition that corroborated my argument that I had made about 20 years earlier that these were multifaceted revolutions that had multiple ideological political sentiments. And that Islamic Republic had doctored all of these things to make everything look Islamic. And here, in mint condition, not in a book that was now sort of out of print, but in Asheville, North Carolina, somebody had collected them. So I wrote back and I said, this is even the more fascinating part of the story, that yes, I would be interested in looking at them. The man who wrote to me said, fine, we'll arrange that, but then he uh, didn't respond to my email for a while. A few weeks went by, and I received an email from somebody who said, I am Cynthia, and I'm Carlos's wife. Carlos is unavailable. Can we have a telephone conversation? Should happen. I called and said, Carlos cannot talk to you because he's in jail. So why is he in jail? So he is in jail because he is a war tax resistor. He does not pay the segment that they have, this is a movement in the uh, in US. I hope it's also a movement in your country. That they have calculated that X percent of our tax goes to military budget, and he refuses to pay that and goes to jail. But it's a very arrangement, it's not it's exactly Islamic Republic kind of jail. Uh, he has examined and studied what jails are best for him, and he goes to that jail. And uh, then now, at this moment, I realized I have been receiving emails from a certain prison in New Mexico. Somebody wanted to contact me from a prison in New Mexico that it was actually Carlos. To make a long story short, I have written it in, in the book that is coming, uh, Carlos term as a, as a war tax resistor uh, prisoner finished and he was released. There's the eventual thing. He said, I can't come to New York. I still have to be in Asheville. I have to I have my parole officer to answer to and all of that. And I flew to, uh, to uh, Asheville and spent a few days with Carlos and his, and his friends. And this to me is where all of this comes together. Namely, in a, in a garage, in Asheville, North Carolina, a group of uh, anti-war activists, veteran against wars, environmentalists, and artists have all come together and created a collective. I mean, I began to cry to think how these posters from the, the aspirations and dreams of a generation that were dreaming for a better world, could not end up in a better place than in Asheville, North Carolina, with this group of young artists, activists, 
environmentalists, I mean, they had created a, a place behind themselves. They were against uh, 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 fossil fuel. And they were collecting oil, vegetable oil, from the surrounding restaurants and creating their own fuel and selling it to uh, the, the thing. I mean, it's just, un and then you go there, it's just, they're like, like hobbits. I mean, sitting there and working on various things and uh, their cubicles, their, 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 and then they cre create magnificent art. Uh, this began to assume, these posters began, and then I began to start looking at these posters, and then, as you see, they are, they represent a gamut. Some enterprising student in Iran, we don't know the, the genealogy of how this collection was actually collected, is very murky, nobody knows. But some enterprising student from the Iranian Confederation, Confederation of Iranian Students is legendary. And the only book, unfortunately, or fortunately, that we have on the Confederation of Iranian Students is by my dear friend, colleague, uh, uh, Martin Askari, uh, on this confederation. You look at these posters and you see solidarity with every progressive cause, civil rights movement in the United States, innumerable number of posters in solidarity with Palestinian uh, national liberation. Uh, events happening in Africa, events happening in United States, in Europe, in solidarity with African students, with African American students, with Arab students. Uh, but anything that's happening, these kids are there, they are out in the streets, they are demonstrating, they're producing a, a thing. But they never lose sight that they are Iranians and they are committed to the cause of liberty in their homeland. And uh, nevertheless, as you see, uh, the, the posters are in Persian, are in Arabic, are in Spanish, are in English, any, any, anything that uh, you, you can think of. And they then uh, uh, assume a, a kind of what I, what I now I'm, uh, began to think along the line of Benya, uh, 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 Benjamin, allegorical significance. That is, they begin to lose their ideological conviction, exude their innocence, their hopes, their aspirations, and become allegorical. Here, what informed my uh, thinking was also another work that I do, that my colleague just mentioned, namely collection of Palestinian cinema. About 30 years ago, when I was, began teaching Palestinian cinema, uh, Arab and Iranian cinema, we didn't have any archive of Palestinian cinema. So I spent 30 years collecting every Palestinian film that I could lay my hand on. There was no archive. Much of the national heritage of Palestine has been destroyed over, over the years. And eventually, I collected a sizable uh, uh, archive of Palestinian cinema. I ded dedicated it to Colombia, which is being preserved and archived and uh, so forth. It is at this point that comparing the factual evidence of these posters with the way that a total narrative was created by Islamic Republic began to make me suspicious of all total narratives. Anyone who comes and lays claim on a total archive, that not only my archive of Palestinian cinema or my archive of Iranian revolutionary posters were incomplete, there were no complete archives. All archives were incomplete. And in fact, it is the incomplete disposition of the archive which is the issue, which is a fact, historical fact. And anyone who comes, I mean, suppose that the two-day party had uh, succeeded, or the Cherikai Fadai Khal had succeeded, or Mujahideen had succeeded. Uh, anyone who came and began to whitewash the history of this uh, multifaceted and chaotic and uh, uh, history would be at fault of manufacturing it. So the total narrative, the way that Zionism now has a total narrative over Palestine that excludes any, uh, any uh, my colleague uh, 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 Abul Hajj has written a book, Facts on the Ground, about the nature of archaeology in, uh, in Palestine with a Bible in one hand and a uh, hammer and thing in your hand, anything that you use, you have to connect it to manufacture a history. And the best critics of this historiography, in fact, are by Israeli historians uh, anyway. Any total uh, a narrative, whether it is a white uh, settler's narrative of United States, oh, this was, nobody was here and we just came and Christopher Columbus discovered 
this land, or if it is uh, any to, or the, the Islamic Republic's totalitarian and total narrative over uh, Iranian intellectual history or political history, any total uh, conception, any totalizing becomes uh, uh, suspect. Now, from this, I began to uh, think along two, two lines, that in the course of these revolutions, whether Iranian revolution of 1977-79 or the succession of Arab revolutions, we are, in fact, dealing with two sets of material. One is the material force, two sets of uh, uh, factors. One is the material forces of the revolution. The material forces that begins with class, and, uh, continues with gender, continues with uh, uh, racialized minorities. These are material forces with which revolutions are, are made. And uh, the second uh, uh, factors, the second register, is the, uh, what I call social imaginaries. How are these forces expressed in the social imaginaries? In my book on the Arab Spring, which is heavily under the influence of Hannah Arendt, I began to think of uh, the public space, which is central in Hannah Arendt's conception of uh, revolution. She makes a distinction between liberation from tyranny and uh, uh, freedom to exercise, to engage in politics. And she articulates and theorizes the notion of public space as the play, which she goes to the later writings of Thomas Jefferson and comes forward uh, as the location of this uh, uh, democratic exercise. But in my reading of the Iranian and of the Arab revolutions, I began to think, uh, wed, wed Marx and Hannah Arendt in my mind. In other words, I began to think of the public space in terms of the formation of three paramount voluntary associations. First was labor unions. Second was women's rights organizations. And third was uh, student organizations. Labor, this, as you can see, is the beginning of a kind of thinking which is, uh, in a classical sense, uh, uh, anarchy in, uh, in uh, suspicion of the uh, total, uh, any kind of a state. And second is a post-colonial anxiety of 200 years after the commencement of the post-colonial thinking and, and nation building, that in contact with colonialism and, and post-colonial nation building, that a state, totalitarian state, whatever its ideology, in fact, destroys the possibility of public resistance. And then instead of le leaving the public resistance to vacuous ideological uh, claims, I began to think of the formation of voluntary associations along these three lines, labor, because labor is the productive force. Without labor, you don't have any, uh, any society. They are, seven million is the size of Iranian labor force times four, the, the number of their families are 28 million out of uh, 75 million. That's what we are talking about, it's not a thing. Second, for their ability to be able to bring down the machinery of uh, tyranny at a at, at moment's notice. Second, immediate addition of women's rights movements because there is, gentlemen, something in our DNA. If they leave it to us, women lose. So women have to be integral, like the two nostrils, like two eyes, integral to the form any revolution. So there is no, the classical, oh, you women now, you wait until the revolution is successful. Uh-uh, right now, as we speak. Theoretically, politically, ideologically, whichever way you think, formation of women's rights movements has to be integral to the very, at the very first step. The third is the student. The student, uh, and also because of the introduction of gender into class and class into gender, which we all have it from uh, uh, Sojourner Truth. Ain't I a woman? As soon as the bourgeois feminism begins to take flight, she introduces the element of uh, class. And uh, third is a student, a student uh, associations, exactly not, I mean, you see it in your own street yesterday in uh, Quebec, a student uprising. And then the, the way that CB, the, your, your uh, Canadian public broadcasting ridicules, I say is a militant student. I just wrote in my Facebook, next thing you know, they're terrorists. And the next thing, they're, they're enemy combatants. 
uh, is not as, and, uh, now the other thing is yesterday my colleague Asif Bayad gave an absolutely fantastic talk about what he calls non-movements, social non-movements, is uh, if you begin with labor unions, they begin, uh, labor unions begin with a specific labor demands, minimum wage, poverty line. But then those very specific labor demands have embedded in them political dimensions. If you look at women's rights movement, they begin with laws concerning custody. Iranian women have been fighting, for example, for the rights of citizenship of children born to Iranian women married to foreigners. Now, these foreigners are not Canadian. There are mostly two million Afghans, for example, who lived as refugees in Iran and they were married and their children were not considered to be uh, Iranian, and as a result, whatever social benefits there, there are to being uh, born as an Iranian child. They have been fighting for nitty gritty. Who is at the forefront of fighting against uh, uh, stoning? Certainly not Shohra uh, Aghdashnu and Suraya M story. Day in, day out, against juvenile execution, against uh, 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 stoning, are ordinary women heroic generations, young, old, middle class, etc. Right now, there is another ghastly legislation being considered that single women will not be uh, issued uh, passports to travel abroad. And who is now fighting it? Look at the sites of Madrasi Feministi, Million Signature, etc. They are fighting it day in, day out, eloquently, persuasively, and here, whether they are veiled or unveiled or call themselves secular or Islamist or whatever, is a secondary issue. The issue is the demand of women's rights, their rights as human beings. Again, as in the labor union, the specificity of women's rights has political dimensions. The same is with the student uh, uh, associations. The, uh, uh, the, the report I read this morning was ridiculing the Canadian, oh, there is a possibility of $70 increase in their tuition, so they were upset. Why $70 increase? Why even one penny? I was ch just telling to my colleagues, I was in, New uh, in Mexico City two years ago, major university, 100,000 students, they pay zero pesos as tuition. Why is it? And then uh, my friend said, well, they're looking south uh, to US where uh, tuitions are also privatized. I said, well, if they're looking south, they should look deeper to the south and look at Mexico, where civilization is. 100,000 students, 30,000 faculty and, uh, and staff, 130,000 Marxists together in one, uh, one site. <laughs> so uh, uh, so the, the specificity of the student demands, tuition, housing, etc., also is an indication they, they entered the job market. Uh, Asif last time was talking about youth being not, not confusing uh, youth movement and the student movement, which, with, which I agree, because his mind is always after forces, social forces that are not on the radar of uh, uh, association and, and revolutionary uprisings. But I'm specifically talking about fo forces, labor, women, student, that their specific demands translates, whether they translate it or they don't, is a different issue. For example, the labor unions and labor activists in Iran did not have, want to have anything to do with the Green Movement because they didn't trust it. But it doesn't mean that there's a specific demands for minimum wage or against child labor or uh, social security, etc., doesn't have a political dimension. It has a strong political dimension, but they don't wish to articulate it and wed it to uh, people that they, they, are, they have every right not to, uh, not to trust. So the two forces of, uh, 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 the, the two factors of social forces and uh, social imaginaries begin to uh, come together. And in the idea of fragmented evidence, and the term that I borrow from Umberto Eco, uh, opera aperta, open work, is where I began to think of these revolutions in a more liberating terms, not as, uh, not as epics on the model of Gamal Abdul Nasser or Muhammad Mossadegh or Gandhi and Nehru, they come and liberate everything, not as epics, but as Bakhtinian novel. A Bakhtinian novel that we don't know what's happening in the, in the second page. Okay? Uh, and as I said to a Norwegian reporter uh, who, during the uh, 
the, uh, both Green Movement and the Arab Spring, but we don't know who are the leaders of these revolutions. And I said, thank God we don't know who they are. We have had it up to here with charismatic uh, figures. We don't want charismatic figures. We want to have a condition that we don't even remember, remember the name of our president. I, I don't know who is the president of Norway or who is the queen, etc. That we need the foundations of institutions, systematic transmutation of culture, not one charismatic figures, whether it's Khomeini and we have had it up to here, no longer, we, this, is, uh, this is changing. That begins to change the metaphor of the revolution. Towards the end of my book on the Arab uh, Spring, I began to develop the idea against total revolution, that overnight one revolution happens, takes control of the state, Marxist-Leninist uh, classical thing, uh, hammer and sickle goes up, uh, Ruzbe is very happy uh, on that day, and everything is hunky-dory. I propose the idea of open-ended revolution. There is a revolution that begins to generate its own language, its own ideals, its own aspirations. That generation after generation, people have actually a stake, something at the stake in the revolution. Not a revolution that right now, young Iranians are very pissed off with my generation. So you made this revolution, and look what mess it is, and you were having a ball in Tehran Film Festival and Shiraz Film uh, Art Fest Festival, and look at the misery that you have created for us. So open-ended revolution, subsequent generations have a say in a specific articulation of, uh, of a, a thing. One more final point I make about what is this opera aperta, open work, open work, is a wonderful idea that Umberto Eco, who is the author of this idea, has, which is a, a, a hermeneutic triangulation between the intention of the author, intention of the reader, and intention of the text. So I, as the author of this talk, have certain intention what I say. You sitting here and listening to me, you have certain intention of how you hear me. How do I, am I being registered? There is already a discrepancy between what I said and what you heard, already, by virtue of any number of factors. But the third issue that Umberto Eco introduces is intention of the text, namely this language that came out for me, independent of what I uh, intended, and these pictures that you saw, they also particularly posit a force. The three are not entirely independent. They are related. We, we, are, we are part of a census communis, as Gadamer would say. But they also have the distinct uh, factors. Translated into contemporary revolutions that are happening not only uh, in Iran or in the Arab world, but also in Eurozone crisis that you see it in Europe, in the Occupy Wall Street movement in the United States, in a student uh, protest here in, in Canada, is a historic moment that in the Arab a book on the Arab Spring, I call it liberation geography. Because our inherited imaginative geography, the West and the rest, Neil Ferguson's uh, uh, you know, habitual thing, the, rest, the West and the rest, that begins to dismantle. When infant mortality rate in Bronx and Harlem are worse than Bangladesh, I don't know exactly where is the West. And when there are beneficiaries of this operation of capital in Kuwait and uh, in, uh, in Pakistan and in, uh, uh, in, in Iran, I don't know where is the uh, uh, thing. Uh, as I always say, there is a difference between the Islam of a rich Kuwaiti sheikh watching his cholesterol in a fancy restaurant uh, in Champs-Élysées and the Islam of an Algerian illegal laborer washing dishes in the same restaurant. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>